There's no doubt that TikTok is one of the most popular mobile apps to ever hit the market, now boasting over 3 billion users and generating over 13 billion in ad revenue alone. Despite its success at both dominating the short-form content market and crippling the attention span of an entire generation, the platform has seemingly been targeted by bans and restrictions ever since its inception, leading to the app being limited in dozens of countries around the world. US lawmakers have long viewed TikTok as a tool for Chinese intelligence, allowing the Chinese government to spy on and potentially manipulate millions of foreign citizens. Others point out that this is in itself somewhat hypocritical, as the US government has been using social media data for for intelligence operations as soon as they figured out it was possible. To make sense of these concerns, we talked to a person who spent nine years in the military, five of which as an active military intelligence analyst. We also spoke to our very own Nathan the Writer, who also happens to be a cybersecurity specialist. Let's dive into the history of these bans, what a foreign country might be able to do with such data, and the concerning future of the TikTok arms race. TikTok's story begins in ancient China, when on the 26th of September 2016, a new short-form video app would hit the market. Launched by ByteDance under the name A.me, the app would limit videos to a maximum of 15 seconds and would follow in the footsteps of other well-known apps such as Musical.ly and the ill-fated Vine. Knowing the A.me name wasn't about to catch on, it would later be renamed Douyin, before being integrated into established messaging apps such as WeChat and Weibo. In just over a year, Douyin was the second most popular photo video app on the Chinese Apple App Store, and to the executives at ByteDance, it was only the beginning. The company would go on to create TikTok, an app with mostly the same features but specifically intended for a foreign market. To this day, Douyin and TikTok have remained entirely separate entities and do not interact with each other in any way. Shortly after TikTok's initial launch, ByteDance would buy lip-syncing app Musical.ly, intending to use it to break into Western markets such as Europe and the US. By August 2018, ByteDance would merge Musical.ly into TikTok completely, with all its content and accounts being transferred onto the platform. Since the merger, the platform has sustained explosive growth worldwide, boasting over 880 million downloads last year alone. And both Douyin and TikTok combined have over 2.1 billion monthly active users. This makes it the third most popular social media platform, just behind YouTube at 2.5 billion and Facebook at a whopping 3 billion. At around the time of its merger with Musical.ly, however, TikTok would start seeing a wave of restrictions across South and Southeast Asia, a region which had spurned its initial global popularity. The trend started in Indonesia, when the Indonesian government cited concerns of both pornographic content and, quote, videos that insult Islam. The ban would stand for just 10 days, by which time the company had established a small moderation team to vet the videos within the country. Although TikTok would be able to satisfy similar concerns in other countries such as Bangladesh, it would have no such luck in India, a nation that would outright ban the app, citing sensitive military concerns and public privacy issues. Although both ByteDance and the Chinese government would push back against the ban, critics pointed out that China itself had been heavily censoring and blocking foreign apps within its borders for years, making its protests seem hypocritical. TikTok would later be banned in Iran, Jordan, and Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, not for privacy violations, but because these particular governments didn't want foreign voices giving their citizens any bright ideas on how a country should be run. Pakistan, on the other hand, would have a particularly rocky relationship with the platform, banning and unbanning the app four separate times, citing immoral content. Somewhere else around the world, cybersecurity agencies had been freaking the fuck out over TikTok, stating that ByteDance had repeatedly been pressured by and given user data to the Chinese government. While TikTok denies these claims, they have previously admitted that they can access user data in China, and that the data has been used by employees to spy on journalists. We at the Swag News team would personally like to say a big thank you to our dedicated Chinese Communist Party handler for watching this video, and we hope they enjoy finding the Australian government secrets hidden in today's sponsor. As we'll cover later in this video, privacy on the internet has now become a thing of the past, and tech companies the world over are making absolute bank by selling your data to anyone with enough Benjamins. In a perfect world, we'd cut out the middleman and let you, the consumer, get paid for this privilege, which is what today's sponsor, Ipsos ISA, is aiming to do. Ipsos is a nearly 50-year-old market research company who want to pay you for your opinion. And judging by the comments section of every video we make, you degenerates sure don't have a shortage of those. The basic 
basic premise is simple. Ipsos will offer you to answer a few surveys about topics that interest you, and you'll be able to redeem credit for things like PayPal, DoorDash, or Amazon. I expect many of you have probably signed up to these types of survey apps before and have never seen a cent for your time. But Ipsos is literally the third largest research agency in the world, so they need the opinions of as many people as they can. To keep it real, you're not about to get rich for completing a few surveys while you're watching Netflix, but you might be able to pay for your favorite battle pass every few months, which isn't exactly a bad deal. If you could stand to earn a few easy dollars, then a sign-up link to iSay will be down below. Because if your data is being sold anyway, the money is going to feel much better in your pocket. Security concerns around TikTok would inevitably be exacerbated by the fact that the platform, to this day, still isn't available in China. There's an old saying that you shouldn't get high on your own supply. China effectively banning TikTok within its own borders signaled a compelling cause for concern. The nations of Australia, New Zealand, Denmark, France, Latvia, Estonia, the Netherlands, Norway, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Ireland, as well as the Parliament of the EU and NATO, would all go on to ban the app from government-issued mobile phones. At this stage, we now get to the United States, a nation with a complicated history with ByteDance, with a push for bans going as far back as the Trump administration. In August 2020, President Donald Trump signed an executive order which would prohibit transactions with TikTok's parent company ByteDance, effectively banning the app within the US. However, if ByteDance sold TikTok to a US company, the app would still be allowed to work in the US, as ByteDance would no longer own the app. The initial frontrunner for the acquisition was Microsoft, who was not only known for making enormous fucking purchases, but would benefit greatly from the app's algorithm and research into AI. ByteDance would decline the offer, expressing that if they were able to get approval from the Chinese government to sell the company, it would rather shut down US operations entirely than be forced to sell to Microsoft. The eventual buyer would be Oracle, an admittedly boring business-facing software company that would be able to strike a balance between the security concerns of the United States and the need for the Chinese government to save face by not outright selling to a US company. In the end, TikTok would become an entirely independent company, with ByteDance being the majority shareholder, while Oracle would be the minority owner. The Chinese government could present the situation as the US pouring money into their homegrown software, and the US government could be satisfied that all US data would be stored on Oracle's all-American servers. This was seemingly the perfect solution. However, the US government still wasn't satisfied that ByteDance would remain as the majority owner, and so the ban would continue. TikTok was obviously fucking pissed that it was doing everything in its power to comply with the US government and still being banned from one of its biggest markets, which would ultimately compel it to sue to block the ban. The ban would eventually be blocked in court, and it would later be lifted entirely by President Biden in 2021. America's favorite dinosaur hunter would then order an investigation into apps that might pose a risk to American privacy or national security as a whole. Later in 2021, as a part of a wider online privacy hearing, TikTok would testify to Congress that US data is stored on American servers, with backups located in Singapore, and that Beijing is not able to access the data. As it turns out, this was a fucking lie. As the following year, it was discovered that the company employees in China are in fact able to access and use US data. When you consider that the Chinese government is both a minority owner and a fucking board member, it stands to reason that if they requested user data from the company, they were almost certainly going to get it. As we mentioned before, we were able to talk to both a former military intelligence analyst as well as a cybersecurity specialist while researching this video, and both seem to believe that the Chinese government could have no problem accessing this data on request. Not only this, but as our anonymous intelligence analyst would quite diligently point out, China passed a law in 2021 stating they could demand any and all data from Chinese-owned companies, regardless of where the data was physically stored. There isn't really a debate about whether the Chinese government could steal user data, because according to its own laws, it is legally entitled to do so. Upon TikTok's admission, members of Congress who previously opposed the ban flipped faster than a Russian gymnast. And since this revelation, TikTok would then be banned on all federal government devices, as well as on the devices of 34 state governments. Additionally, dozens of colleges around the US have banned TikTok from their Wi-Fi networks in an effort to improve their own data and research security. Since then, the federal government has attempted to block TikTok nationwide for all people, 
although this was eventually blocked when voted upon. With this in mind, lawmakers in Montana have successfully banned TikTok for users in the state, although this ban faces implementation challenges. First and foremost, app hosting services like Apple and Google only track users by country instead of a specific town or city, and so it might not be able to determine when a person enters Montana from a neighboring state. TikTok themselves also stated that, in order to comply with the bill intended to stop them harvesting users' data, they would in fact need to access their data. Furthermore, there is a concern that people who want to circumvent the ban can simply use a VPN and either appear in another state or another country entirely. Perhaps unsurprisingly, TikTok has already sued to block this ban, stating that it is a violation of the First Amendment guaranteeing freedom of speech. Lobbying groups, known nationwide as the most powerful branch of government, would go on to team up with content creators, who would also sue to stop the ban. Their reasoning is that TikTok would be declared guilty of a crime without trial, and that no other platform was nearly as conducive to the Family Guy slash Subway Surfers attention lifespan hack. The ban itself has also come under fire for being at the very least hypocritical. Viewers may remember the infamous PRISM program, famously leaked 10 years ago by Edward Snowden, which allowed the US to force internet providers like Google or Yahoo to turn in data upon request. The threshold for such a request could be as broad as a person searching for certain terms, and as the government would be making up these terms anyway, pretty much no one was safe from the government gobbling up all of a person's private data. While a ban on TikTok is popular among Americans as a whole, younger demographics who tend to use TikTok more frequently are much more opposed to the change, a trend that drops off sharply for citizens over 30. Perhaps counterintuitively, however, young people were also the most active about and concerned for their personal data online. In general, the subset of people most opposed to the ban were unsurprisingly those who use TikTok on a frequent basis. What's abundantly clear while researching this video is that the whole concept of data harvesting on this scale is often hard to properly understand. Perhaps most of all, by the lawmakers in charge of setting a framework for reform. Here's just a few clips from the congressional hearing earlier this year, where the United States representatives grilled TikTok CEO Shu Zichu for more than five hours. You say with 100% certainty that TikTok does not use the phone's camera to determine whether the content that elicits a pupil dilation should be amplified by the algorithm. Can you tell me that? We do not collect body, face, or voice data to identify our users. We do not. The, the, the How, only wait, wait, you, you don't? The, no. The only face data that you get, that we collect, is when you use the filters to have, say, sunglasses on your face, we need to know where your eyes are. Mr. Chu, does TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network? Only if the user turns on the Wi-Fi. I'm sorry, I may not understand the So if I have a TikTok app on my phone and my phone is on my home Wi-Fi network, does TikTok access that network? It will have to, to access the network to get connections to the internet, if, if that's the question. Is it possible then that it could access other devices on that home Wi-Fi network? Co Congressman, we do not do anything that is beyond any industry norms. Um, I believe the answer to your question is no. It could be technical. Let me get back to you. The Chinese Communist Party is engaged in psychological warfare through TikTok to deliberately influence U.S. children. Although the first few questions are pretty funny, off-brand Yosemite Sam kind of has a point. When we spoke to our aforementioned experts about the implications of a government having the keys to such a social media platform, they painted a pretty frightening picture. According to the Pew Research Center, 10% of Americans say that they regularly use TikTok as their source of news, and that this figure is as high as 26% between the ages of 18 to 29. Should a government be able to control TikTok, they would, for example, be able to target specific demographics of a foreign country, and bombard them with content that aligns with one political party over another. They would also be able to stifle the efforts of certain movements that may conflict with their own interests. A pretty terrifying thought if said country had, for example, a spotty human rights record. When most elections are only won by a few percentage points, being able to have this much influence over as much as 10% of the population is a worrying prospect. It goes without saying that having this kind of power could swing an election to whatever party the Chinese government sees as more favorable to its own interests. 
As our writer Nathan would point out, many argue that events such as the Brexit vote and America's 2016 election were determined in large part to data collection and analysis companies, being able to run extremely targeted persuasion campaigns. The Russian government in particular does this kind of thing to its own citizens all the time, as by being able to restrict the information a person receives, it's possible to sway a population to believe any propaganda they wish to promote. It was also highlighted by our former intelligence analyst that TikTok could also be used for intelligence collection. For example, if a soldier were to make a TikTok inside a foreign military base, the holders of this information would be able to know what country it was from, what they were wearing, and possibly the equipment that was taken with them. A famous example of social media compromising a military operation is the case of Alexander Sotkin, a Russian soldier who in 2014 used geotagging in his Instagram uploads while in Ukraine. Viewers might recall that the Kremlin had officially denied having any Russian forces within the country at the time, which which, thanks to Alex, was proven to be a lie. In the current year, a soldier can't hit the gritty in front of a huge stack of night vision equipment without the enemy figuring out that a night operation is probably on the way. Furthermore, if say the sons or daughters of prominent business leaders or government figures were to use TikTok regularly, this could also make it easier to gather intelligence on these high-priority individuals. Getting dirt on an up-and-coming politician, for example, could pay dividends later in their career should they reach a high-up position of power. And this, in itself, should scare the shit out of any democracy enjoyers watching. Of course, there are a myriad of other ways to gather such intelligence without the use of a single app. But for a Chinese spy agency, this would be like setting the difficulty to easy. When we asked our intelligence analyst about their personal assessment of TikTok and whether they recommend people using it, they simply answered with, quote, Absolutely fucking not. At this point, viewers might have already connected some dots, because even if the United States banned TikTok altogether, this doesn't mean that an actor like the Chinese government still couldn't influence foreign citizens through other means. After all, these influence campaigns were successful well before TikTok hit the market. You don't need to own a social media platform to undermine democracy, but it sure fucking helps. There's nothing stopping the Chinese government from legally buying an absolute metric fuckton of data from US social media sites and then just paying for advertising space to target citizens using the collected data. It would likely be more expensive, but the business of influencing election outcomes of world superpowers has never exactly been cheap. This comes to what lawmakers have proposed to counter such an eventuality, which currently manifests in a menacingly named proposed bill called the Restrict Act, which intends to criminalize such acts as subverting elections and sabotaging digital infrastructure. The bill itself has been criticized by both Republicans and Democrats alike for being either rushed, too broad, too restrictive, and not well written. Supposedly, lawmakers didn't even have national security briefings when it was written, and the bill is said to be so broad that people are comparing it to the Patriot Act, the original document that made American privacy a thing of the past. Critics have even argued that the wording could ban VPNs from operating within the country, and people who are familiar with our longest sponsor will know that we really don't want that to happen. Another dimension to this whole debate isn't something US lawmakers would discuss, but for the longest time, the US government had a complete monopoly on harvesting the data of their own citizens. It's also a poorly kept secret that the United States itself has had a long history of swaying foreign elections all in the name of apple pie and baseball which is probably why the whole TikTok situation is seen to be as scary as it is. Uncle Sam is terrified of this shit because he's the reigning champion of doing it himself. When trying to prevent a foreign government from harvesting the data of your citizens and using this data to influence their decision making, it's always going to be an uphill battle. The US government could block any payments from Chinese IP addresses, but this wouldn't stop people from using VPNs to get around such restrictions. The US government could block all purchases from Chinese organizations, and the Chinese government could simply use subsidiaries. You could also attempt to look internally and block social media companies from selling data entirely, but this would upend the entire social media business model and force what is essentially online infrastructure to become a paid service instead. Even if the US government managed to pull off this impossible task, the Chinese government could simply wait for US-based data breaches and buy the information on the dark web for a lot more than their competitors could hope to pay. If all of this fails, China notoriously has one of the most skilled state-backed hacking programs in the world, which will almost certainly manage to steal millions of pieces of user data given enough time. China is of course mostly immune to these types of counter-efforts itself, 
as its authoritarian style of government can clamp down on these types of foreign influence campaigns much more quickly and without contention. Democracies are quite unfortunately not inherently immune from this type of manipulation. And while methods of rigging elections in the traditional sense have become nearly impossible with modern technology, it's now easier to swing elections by going straight to the source. After all, if a foreign government had millions of dollars at their disposal, knew more about yourself than even your closest friends, and were able to expose you to a particular political perspective multiple times a day, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that you'd probably change some of your core beliefs. Hell, if we were given those kinds of resources, we could probably convince our audience that Sonando is an entertaining and worthwhile channel. But alas, this task remains impossible. When we asked Nathan, our resident cybersecurity expert, how the hell a democratic government is expected to combat such large-scale manipulation, the answer was to start with people themselves. Educating the population about how to identify these propaganda campaigns could go a long way to essentially inoculating a nation's citizens from being easily influenced. Many schools are now thankfully teaching students about media bias and how to spot fabricated news online. But as a news team of around 10 people who spends two weeks of every month doing exactly that, we're still not entirely immune from these efforts either. The entire concept of a real and functional democracy hasn't even been possible for very long in the lifespan of human history. And according to last year's Democracy Index, only 24 nations in the entire world can call themselves a full democracy. True, functioning democracies require an educated population doing what's best for their nation. And if we can all understand that we'll never truly be immune from propaganda, this system of government might last long enough to finally reach its peak. What if it's me looking down on